the second round of today's talks. The speaker of the second round, the first speaker, is Dirk Helm. From a more formal point of view, he is a professor at ETH. He was nominated a member of the German Academy of Sciences. He also is the founder or co-founder of the ETH Risk Center and he was recently appointed as a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on Complex Systems. The name is appropriately complex as well. <laughs> uh, from a more informal view, uh, Dirk is a great visionary guy whom I met as a department head when he was launching his future ICT initiative, European flagship initiative. We had a lot of discussions and I was uh, very much surprised and amazed about his out-of-the-box thinking and in particular as a computer science scientist, of course, I was so happy to get someone or to, to know someone who provides us with a, with a lot of challenges to, to be solved. You know, it's normally the other way around. We have solutions and the question is where are the problems and in this case Dirk brought a lot of challenging problems with him <laughs> and some of them we are about to be trying to solve, others others uh, probably not. Anyway, uh, Dirk, the, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for the <coughs> kind invitation. I'm very happy to be back in Singapore in this place where innovation is at home. And uh, I found myself being asked uh, to talk about the art of innovation. Let's see what I can say about it. So when we started the Future ICT initiative, we were thinking about global scale problems. And it turned out that there were many fields, actually, where we didn't know much. So we have changed the world by globalization, technological revolutions, but the world we have created is not well understood from a scientific perspective. So we lack a non-equilibrium economics to a large extent. We have very little knowledge about systemic risk and uh, integrated risk management, for example. And there are many other areas where we were very surprised to find so little knowledge. So it's pretty clear that we need to catch up with the speed at which the world is changing it's not enough to make the aftermath when another disaster has happened. It would be better if we could overtake <coughs> the pace of events and get insights before disasters happen. Insights also that help us actually uh, to use the opportunities that our change world is offering us. But innovation is a challenge, and Alexander von Humboldt actually summarized it in these few lines over here. So, first of all, people deny that innovation is required. And then in the next stage, uh, they would say innovation is not effective. And once they recognize it might be effective, they would say, okay, it's not important. <coughs> and then they will say, it's not worth the effort. And one day it's there, everybody enjoys the benefit, and people will attribute the innovation to other people and forgot about, uh, forget about the previous stages. And that's something that uh, many pioneers have experienced. And here are a number of quotes, actually, that illustrate that quite well. Fooling around with alternating currents is just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. Thomas Edison. We're using it every day, of course. Or let's have a look at this quote. It's a great invention, but who would want to use it anyway? That was after a demonstration of the telephone. And uh, what about computers? Thomas Watson chairman of IBM in 1943 said, I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. <laughs> this is one of them. <coughs> and finally, what about television? While theoretically and technically television may be feasible, commercially and financially, it is an impossibility. And we could actually extend this list. 
it applies to basically all major innovation. So there's an innovation dilemma. We want innovation, but there are no rewards for innovation. We make the lives of innovators, of pioneers, very difficult. Because innovations are opposed by the establishment. And it takes a very long time, maybe 10 to 30 years, until you finally succeed. So innovations need to be supported in the initial stage. But uh, how to identify what is the innovation we're supporting? That is really a problem. And we can see that different countries are doing differently well in terms of innovation. We show here <coughs> knowledge importers in red and knowledge exporters in green. We can clearly see the areas of the world which are most innovative. So generating knowledge is not enough. You want to be the first one to come up with a new idea. And so coming back to the initial question, you know, understanding the globalized world and so on, can innovation be steered by politics? Well, I actually don't think so, because you cannot innovate like this. And external control generally does not work well in complex systems. And science is a complex system where many things have to come together in order to come up with a new and successful idea. And there are many different influences pulling scientists in different directions. So this makes it very difficult really to focus yourself on the subject, not to be distracted by others. Well, we know that politics often likes to have innovations that uh, will produce products, not just knowledge, theoretical knowledge. And uh, let's have a look at the uh, invention of TV. I saw this newspaper article in a museum about Maxwell, the inventor of electrodynamics. And he's known for a quote that says, I don't know what electricity is good for, but I'm pretty sure that Her Majesty's government will soon tax it. <coughs> when we look at the European Union, then you sometimes have the impression that the way science is supported is very much the way agriculture is supported. That means some politicians see it as a subsidy that you have to give in order to promote certain kinds of activities. But it's a very different thing we're talking about here. Because um, if you grow food, then this is really a mainstream thing. We know how to do it, we make mass production. While when we talk about innovation, then we're looking for a rare species. For the first instance, when it appears, it's very much different, really. And so, Science is not like agriculture. Science is more like arts. And it's very important also to recognize that scientists are special people. They're not driven to the same extent as other people, some other people, by, by money or power. They're driven by curiosity. And that needs to be taken into account. So that, I think, they share with artists. And uh, so we have to think about conditions that would actually make this kind of creativity possible. A scientist is supposed actually to question the knowledge that other people consider sure. That means they have to overcome blind spots. And that requires intellectual independence. If somebody tells a scientist what he should Fine. then how could you find the stuff that other people are not even thinking about? So how to influence somebody whose job is to be independent? And I think if you start influencing a scientist, he couldn't do as good as a job. 
I'd also like to point out that we should not put research and development together. Very unfortunately, we always say R and D as if it was the same thing. But it's completely different because research is about coming up with a solution to a problem where we don't have a clue what the solution might be. And development is applying knowledge that we have, put it together, build a product or whatever. So that's a very different situation. And so it's mixing up apples and pears. A little bit like if you would ask a physicist to fix the motor of your car, which most physicists would not be able to do, or ask a mathematician to do your tax declaration, or these kind of things. So it's just really mixing up two things that need to be distinguished in order to be successful. In, it. in fact, innovation requires something like an ecosystem of people and ideas with very different types of people and different types of knowledge that have to find together. So if we start standardizing processes, I think this is just the end of innovation. So I know that uh, later Nobel Prize winner was asked what was his plan for the next five years of research and he was saying, I don't make five years now. We've done that in the previous Soviet Union. Um, and actually, he didn't get the job, but he got the Nobel Prize. So that should tell us something. Now we know that in science, there is a rich get richer effect. I mean, famous people get more famous. Well-sighted people get more citations. And so, the question comes up, how is it possible that young people or new ideas ever have a chance to compete with those who are established in science? And we have studied this question, and it turns out that new ideas, when published, trigger off a, a citation cascade. But that affects not only the paper just published, it affects also other papers that the author has written. That means it draws the attention of people to the whole body of work and makes the whole body of work and the author more famous. Now, each paper has a different boosting factor, as we call this. And those boosting factors are parallel distribution. I mean, there are very small, uh, many small boosting factors. But on the other hand, there are also boosting factors that are arbitrarily large. That means there is a stochastic, a, a random process that makes sure that there will always be a publication and has a boosting factor that can compete with this massive effect, with the rich get richer effect. And this can trigger actually scientific revolutions or lead to novel prices, as we have seen. Now, one very important factor for innovation is actually diversity, and that's something that innovation has in common with evolution. So, if biologists study evolution and they can they see that the increase in the rate of fitness uh, is proportional to the variability. And um, that means diversity is really very important. But from this follows another problem. How would we find consensus in science? So how to find consensus in science? We know that some scientific fields are quite fragmented such as sociology, for example. And uh, the question is, why does it happen? And how can it be overcome? Or is it bad at all? We've been looking at a computer model. And this computer model is looking at individual scientists who are influencing each other. And you can see that, in fact, 
this model can reproduce the formation of schools. That means we have groups of scientists who agree with each other, but different groups would completely disagree. We have different explanations of the same fact, which is actually the green cross in the middle. So we also see that many of those schools have theoretical approaches or scientific approaches that would not be consistent with the facts. And in fact, there is the problem that people can be very easily influenced by other people. We call this social influence. We've made a very simple experiment here. People had to estimate a fact. The fact in this case was 200. So 200 was the answer, and there were those many people who were estimating the right answer. Most of them didn't actually have a good idea of what the answer was. And then, however, we informed them about the estimates of all the others, and you can see there is a process of convergence. So there is consensus formation. But consensus is not a guarantee for being right. You can see that this over here. So this is quite a bit of the real value of 200. Well, actually, in the beginning, the geometrical mean of those estimates was better. That means, originally, before people influence each other, the true answer was in the range of the answers that people had given. While after a number of interactions, actually, people were convinced that they had found the right answer, but the right answer was not anymore in the range of the answers given by people. That is kind of a disastrous situation, right? So social influence can be quite bad. And this is what can happen when following the trend. And basically, you know, scientists might be totally wrong. And there are many people who are asking, do we have the right economic theory to understand the markets? So the former president of the ECB, Jean-Claude Trichet, said that when the crisis came, the serious limitations of existing economic and financial models immediately became apparent. We felt abandoned by conventional tools. And so, this is not good if the European Central Bank cannot rely on the models that are state of the art. So what can you do? We came up with the idea that we should not all the time focus on publishing papers that would present reports and then try to convince all the other people that they should cite this paper in order to make us successful. Because in fact, as your book was already pointing out, there are so many publications that don't even say what the problem is. On the other hand, there are so many problems that don't have an answer. So I thought it would be important actually to raise the important questions, the right questions. This turns out to be a very difficult thing. We don't even have journals to pose questions. This is a very strange thing. And future ICT actually came up with position papers in order to make a difference here and basically stimulate the thinking of scientists and the creativity there are so many problems that are actually too difficult for any single scientist to solve them. So we need to find new ways to innovate together. And eventually we have identified a number of questions, actually many sets of questions, and each of these sets of questions has many sub-questions. Um, and hopefully, Posing this question will stimulate science in the very same way as actually the, the Hilbert question that stimulated 
uh, mathematics at that time. And then, of course, some funding can help the process. Of course, all societies need some food, as we know. But in, in principle, the issue is that you would move a field forward by posing questions. The funding, by the way, could also come from crowdfunding. So there's a lot of activity now which is changing the shape of science and how science works. And I will now show you a number of examples. But before I do this, I'd like to point out that there's another important thing. If you really want to have products in the end, don't expect that the scientist who comes up with an invention would build products and finally tour around the different companies and find a company to build this product. This is basically not happening and it's not possible. Of course, there's too much distance between a theoretical progress and the building and selling of a product. So it's very important that we build knowledge transfer supply chains where basically once a theoretical invention has been made, somebody else takes it over and works on the implementation of it. And finally, somebody else is taking it over and brings it uh, to industry to produce it. And um, so that requires really to create a, the right kinds of networks between different kinds of universities like ECH Zurich and universities of applied sciences in order to bridge this huge gap. But also intellectual property is very important. How to organize this? Future ICT came up with this kind of onion-shaped solution where we said, okay, we want to enable many scientists to participate in creating this new science. So we want an open platform a participatory approach. And uh, we try to, to restrict knowledge as little as possible, but of course, companies often want to restrict knowledge. So we, <coughs> we would say, OK, it's possible in principle, but you would have to pay a price in order to lock the knowledge, <laughs> in order to have incentives, the incentives to open up the knowledge and thereby foster actually new creativity and new knowledge. We've also gone away in future ICT from a concept where there was a scientific leader who was basically coordinating everybody and telling everybody what he had to do. Because we recognize that a project with hundreds or even thousands of scientists is a complex system. And a complex system is very hard to control or to steer. A complex system shows self-organization going on. So we were asking ourselves, can we use self-organization processes actually in order to stimulate innovation? So we said, OK, we don't have a leader. We rather have a coordinator. The coordinator tries to bring together different people, connect them, make sure the right kind of information gets from A to B. Um, so our job was basically to enable, to facilitate the data, to, to catalyze, in fact. Then there was this other problem of integration of knowledge. So in a company, of course, there is very much a top-down approach. And you say, OK, everybody now uses this kind of software in order to have compatibility. But we had scientists from physics, engineering, social science, and so on and so on, using very different platforms. It would never have been possible for them to use the same platform. So we were coming up with uh, processes like convergence and co-evolution, which again is based on self-organization, but would uh, eventually lead uh, to people coming together. And I, I think actually this is very important because you know it may take two years of time 
four people to adapt to the same software, and in two years of time, however, this software might be outdated. So we really need to have new approaches in order to accelerate innovation. Another factor that largely accelerates innovation, I believe, is bringing people from different fields together. That means natural scientists, engineers, and social scientists, which, which usually don't talk to each other so much. But I can tell you that our experience was that the most interesting questions came out where those different disciplines did not agree with each other. So basically, the most exciting questions are where these continental plays of disciplines are next to each other. This is where the energy is released, and where cre the creative potential can be unleashed. So I'm now coming to the <coughs> different platforms that can help to accelerate innovation. And one of them is, of course, personalized innovation. You may know that there was this issue of American interest and basically proclaimed the end of the university as we know it. In fact, the question is, do we still need lecture halls where all the students have to sit together? Couldn't they watch a movie? Couldn't they learn in a chat room and teach each other how to solve certain problems? And there are so many possibilities, also serious games. There would be a good possibility to get a feeling for laws of physics, for example, or in chemistry or biology. So you could learn in a playful way. And it's quite surprising you know, how ambitious people are to collect points in a computer game. So there are inbuilt incentives that make people work hard because they want to reach the next level. If a professor tells a student, you know, you have to work hard to reach the next level, that's something else. So I think we should find ways that people are driven by their own curiosity. We should stimulate this curiosity. This is very important. And uh, this actually can be supported by all sorts of platforms. So we know Mendeley and ResearchGate, which came up recently. We're also working on some of those platforms. Uh, the Vivo platform was developed by a uh, colleague, Kathy Berner, Frank van Harmelin. Uh, we're working on Living Archive, that's kind of a mini Google for open data, so it makes it much easier for you to find social data, data of all kinds, which took a lot of time before to identify. And li Living Science, which is um, illustrating where science is happening, so it's analyzing publication and citation data, and um, also We'll look at interaction effects between fields and scientists. And then we have VJO, a virtual journal that would pull together all those papers that you might be interested in. And those could come from your field, but also all sorts of other fields where you have never looked into the journal, but it could uh, be still relevant for you what other people have published. So in my field of evolutionary game theory, there is work going on in physics and mathematics and social science, economics and biology. And so, so you could easily overlook something. So there would be different kinds of filters, actually. And this is very important in our approach that we would not specify the filter for you, like many recommender systems do today, where the company decides what is recommended to do in the world way. But you could customize your own filters. You could have 10, 20 different filters. It could be one which is randomized, one looking at controversial papers, others at the, at the latest papers, others highly rated papers, or you might want to look into the <coughs> papers that your biggest competitor or the most admired scientist uh, is looking at. And you would exchange your filters with other people, you would change them a little bit, so you would get 
an evolution of filters actually would be an innovation ecosystem in itself to have these recommendations. So I'm concluding now, but like to point out, we shouldn't search the scientists where the light is, where we have a good overview. We need to look into the dark spots where nobody has been before, even though it's uh, very difficult to find your way. And we need to be aware that our thinking very much determines what we see. There are so many things still to be discovered in front of our nose, which nobody has looked at because nobody has thought about it. And our brain was not trained to look at these kind of things. So this is very important to recognize that when we are raised in a world to receive vertical bars, and then after some years we're exposed to another world with vertical uh, horizontal bars, mm -hmm. we may not be able to see them. It will take some time, but it might have always been there. So we cannot trust our brains, I mean, wha what our intuition is suggesting. This applies particularly to complex systems where there's so many emerging phenomena that are really counterintuitive, <coughs> such as faster and slower effects and phenomena. And so I sometimes end my talk with a demonstration where I show that we need to overcome the barriers of our conventional thinking. And that's it. Thank you very much. Young innovators, you don't 
have so many citations yet, uh, and are really the only people working on the new subject, how would you really identify the value of this kind of work? If it's outside of the scope of what everybody else is doing. Uh, and I think maybe a, a random way of, of giving money is <laughs> maybe the best strategy over here for giving a, a certain flat rate of money to, to people. I, I think it's very important to realize that I mean, innovations are a non-limited resource, you know, in contrast to oil and, and material resources. And every innovation adds value to the society. So I think we should put everything to foster this climate of, of innovation. And sometimes I'm reminded of, you know, there was this uh, famous uh, saying by Mark Cape, you know, uh, information is the oil of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could change that a little bit and say that innovation is the oil of the 21st century. Yeah, but uh, altogether I think we're putting too much money in ideas that are already established and that would fly anyway. Yes, there is some question.